Insurgency. So wealth of knowledge and experience. He taught here in Soch. He's actually my IR teacher when I was here as a cadet. Uh, so it's been a fun time kind of reminiscing about that. Um, I still do remember the uh, the going uh, kind of cadet talk of, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> for the appropriate audience. Crap that Captain Emery says. Um, and we kept a running list of all the craziness we did in class. And we took those gems with us for the rest of our career. So it was always a lot of fun. Uh, Colonel Emery is, uh, has a great sense of humor and is, is also a very candid speaker. So. Um, you know, we are going to videotape some of this, but I, for your purposes, I mean, it's it's uh, somewhat off the record, so we'd rather you guys not kind of tweet about it all, and we'll make a decision about the, the video after the talk is over. Um, Colonel Emery, of late, though, worked on hostage uh, uh, rescue and crisis um, at the, you know, the top of the government, trying to reform the way that we deal with American hostages, um, and has just you know, finished his career, retiring with, with honor, um, just recently, as he helped us pass legislation to take care of our Americans who are... Uh, captured and hostage abroad. Um, so with that, thanks so much for coming today. Uh, it's going to be a great conversation. We like to make this interactive. So um, as as Colonel Emery is talking, please uh, feel free to ask questions at the end. Please engage him. Ask very many questions about his experience. This is your chance to ask the man, uh, in this case Colonel Emery, about his very raw experience uh, and, and to learn. So thanks so much for being here, and uh, please join me in a warm welcome for Colonel Emery. So by the way, a background, uh, I'm from Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, I was a 1993 grad here. Uh, what I like to emphasize up front after people are overly nice about me is uh, I pretty much screwed up everything in my career I could have as I made my way along. Uh, West Point, I went to staff for MA-102. Uh, I think I had to redo a land nav course and the basic course, but don't hold me to that. And that's kind of embarrassing, so maybe it didn't happen and it was all a nightmare. Uh, Ranger school, got to do that twice. Uh, Q course, I got to do Trek twice, but I guess I don't do Trek anymore, so you can't, you can't hold me accountable for that. But I, I got through it the second time. Uh, so, I mean, for me, uh, I, I'll talk about my career and the stuff I did, uh, you know, more by way of uh, if an idiot like me can do it, then uh, you know you guys have nothing to worry about. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different approach, and I'll kind of give you a quick career retrospective, and I guess we could open it up to uh, questions if uh, none of you have slipped into a coma and died by then. Um, so. Uh, I, I kind of titled this Moby Dick for those of you that were forced to read it before. Uh, so, for, for me, the, uh, the, the one point in my career that actually had the most influence over the rest of my career was my time as a lieutenant. Uh, I was at a light infantry in, in Panama. It was 1994, so a year after what happened in Mogadishu. Uh, and there was peace in our time. Uh, you know, we'd never have another tank battle, never do anything like Iraq again. Uh, we won the Cold War, go team. And uh, now, what do we do about the peace? And, uh, so I report to Panama, and our big mission was dealing with refugees. And uh, basically what happened was, uh, Haiti erupted in chaos. Uh, and there were Haitian refugees fleeing uh, for the shores of the U.S. And we were turning them back because U.S. policy was, well, we don't, we don't let Haitians in. So Castro, being very smart uh, in terms of uh, uh, U.S. policy, told uh, uh, basically, basically Cuban dissidents and anybody who wanted to, hey, why don't you guys head to the U.S. too? And a flood of Cuban refugees started heading to the U.S. shores. Uh, so we're put in kind of a weird position. We're normally a, a lot, uh, a lot better towards Cuban refugees than the Haitians. And it was a really screwed up policy, frankly. So what we did was we rounded everybody up. And then we decided that we'll invade Haiti, make Haiti a better place, and we can send the Haitians back to Haiti, and then we'll figure out the Cubans. 
Uh, obviously, this is my view of it, but that's what I've seen as a platoon leader. So here I am in Panama, and what we end up doing is we end up uh, welcoming Cuban refugees that we're going to hold in camps in Panama. Uh, while we deal with Haiti, so we can let the Haitians go home, and then send the Cubans we can allow in America. I mean, it was screwed up, but that was policy, and, and we were painfully aware that that's what, what we're a part of. Uh, Marines from Gitmo, who, who dealt with smaller numbers of refugees, came to Panama and basically advised us that uh, how we were setting up the camps, the security, and everything was just a total mess. Uh, basic civil disturbance ops, you know, how you pull the shield, the baton, tear gas, all that, we just weren't trained properly. Uh, the Marines basically warned us that we were looking at a, at a fiasco. And, uh, and I, I took it to heart. Me and my platoon sergeant, uh, affectionately nicknamed Triple Six, uh, we, we realized that uh, you know, our, our bigger mission is infantry men was uh, civil disturbance operations, putting down any potential riots, and here we are being told there will be riots. Uh, and we did realize that we were ill prepared and also ill equipped. Uh, and it, it, you know, I was a brand new lieutenant, so for those of you that are firsties, especially, I mean, that's pretty much where you are now. I mean, it, nothing changes magically over the next couple of years between graduation and getting your first unit. I mean, where you are now is pretty much where I was as a brand new second lieutenant showing up in Panama. Uh, and for me, it, it was almost, uh, you know, it, it was a mix of like duty and honor and, you know, what do I do? I've identified. We're basically looking at uh, getting destroyed by rioting refugees, so what, what can I do about it? And I was actually ready to go to my battalion commander and somehow symbolically, you know, threaten or resign and protest or something like that. Uh, and you know, one of my squad leaders basically pulled me aside and was like, sir, we're, we're better off with you than without you. You're a second lieutenant. Everybody knows it's going to be a mess. You know, we, we basically we need you here, not getting fired for nothing when it isn't going to change anything. Uh, so I I, uh, I abided by my squad leader's advice, and, and I'll readily admit, I mean, having a squad leader that you respect telling you to back down, uh, I respected him, but it also was more comfortable backing down than uh, you know ending my career on my or whatever it was, you know, as a lieutenant. So, I mean, I, I sometimes wonder about how that kind of, you know, my thought process there, but I defer to him. Um, and, you know, sure enough, the, the camps rioted. We had four refugee camps and two of them rioted. Uh, my company was sent to one of the camps, and uh, we were given these orders to march into the camp and clear the refugees from this big open area. And it, I mean, the short of it is it, it turned into uh, like Pickett's Charge. Uh, I was uh, I was first platoon leader, so I got to lead my company in this column in this big open field, and we were basically decimated. Uh, nobody died, although one of my guys was reported KIA on the medevac after, but uh, but no Americans died. Uh, and we don't even know the casualties. And we heard different numbers. The one that we, that those of us who were there agreed on was that we had about 200 injured in the riots. Uh, and it went pretty much the way we expected it to. Uh, you know, and I, I'll never forget uh, when we got chased out of the camp as we're basically, you know, pulling folks with broken bones and everything. A couple guys heavily concussed. You know, one of them, you know, reported killed, but they didn't resuscitate him. Uh, I mean, we had this mass casualty evac uh, with just uh, bloody bodies everywhere. This is a big deal. We weren't even prepared for the medevac. Uh, and you know, there I was. I mean, would it have made a difference if I said anything? I mean, I was angry. Uh, I, I felt betrayed by the chain of command. Just in general, I mean, again, it's sort of at, at what level could anybody have done anything? I don't know. I mean, that's the thing. As a second lieutenant, this was, you know, 
This was uh, uh, this was December eighth, uh, nineteen ninety four. So I'd been in the unit since probably like August, you know, and that was you know my first experience with a big deployment, and it stayed with me for years. Um, I, I read a lot about PTSD. And I didn't feel like I fit that category. I just knew I dwelled on it a lot. I questioned my decisions. Uh, knowing that disaster is likely going to strike, we turned the platoon as, as hard as we could to the point that uh, when we marched into that camp, when everybody ran out of the camp, uh, you know, and, as I say, in defeat, we stayed together. And at one point, we were kind of by ourselves in the camp trying to get out of there because we didn't break and run. Uh, and, it, and the irony was the better training actually caused us to suffer more casualties because we were you know, kind of the last ones in there for a little while until we finally made our way out. And that stuff just haunted me for years. And for me, uh, I mean, I, I was wounded, you know, uh, you know, in a kind of deeply emotional way. What could I have done different? What could I have done better? Or maybe there's nothing I could have done. I just didn't know, but I knew I dwelled on it. And uh, a side part of this that I'll admit, though, is, uh, I mean, the actual experience itself, you know, 150 of us and hundreds of them trying to kill us, there actually was something uh, pretty damn incredible about the experience at the same time. It, it was, for me, it, it was really weird because uh, in a strange way, I enjoyed it, but then after we got all the casualties out to the uh, mass casualty evac site, I walked off and bawled. Uh, I mean, for my men. Uh, and, and that was something else that for me was just really hard to understand was in a weird way I enjoyed it, and in a weird way it was the worst day of my life at the same time. So that followed me for years, December 8th, 1994. So, I wanted some way to kind of a do-over. Uh, you know, I wanted a way to kind of refight the battle, of apply what I'd learned. I don't know. And it just kind of haunted me. And uh, I'd always wanted to join special forces. I got into special forces because honestly, they're probably recruiting more people than they needed that year, and I made it in. Uh, only half joking on that. I mean, my classmates that were with me were far better officers than I was. Uh, but I commanded a couple of special forces teams uh, and was on what I thought was going to be my last deployment. Uh, and we, we left uh, August of 2001 and deployed to Kazakhstan. And here I am on my last deployment. I'd already figured out what I was going to do after the Army. I'd had a moment where I finally kind of made peace with what happened in Panama and that there is, there, I, I wasn't going to have a do-over. You know, for me it was, oh, at the end of my team time, it'll be this time to leave the Army because there wasn't really much else for me to do. Uh, and then 9-11 happens and it you know, threw everything out the window. So I thought I was on my last deployment with my team before I'd have to move up to the headquarters because I was about as senior a team leader as, as we had at the time. Uh, and the next thing I know, we're, we're invading Afghanistan. And, and this is where, this is where I kind of emphasize some of the Moby Dick aspect of this because I'll, I'll tell you about Afghanistan and the decisions that I made, but I want you to know that I mean, I, I was heavily influenced by this angst, some degree of PTSD. I mean, I was wounded by the whale, and I wanted to go back and get the whale. And that whale was war, you know? I mean, everybody told me that, you know, these riots weren't war. OK, well, I'll tell you, having now checked the block and seen a real war, I mean, the riots are still the most horrible thing I ever had to deal with. Uh, <laughs> but for me, there was something about facing that whale again. And, uh, you know, for better or for worse, here it was uh, served up on a silver platter. And uh, we we're, were going to be invading Afghanistan. Uh, I had a really good team. We were a senior team. Uh, we, managed to, uh, we managed to 
kind of be about the fifth or sixth in the queue to, uh, to go into Afghanistan. Uh, the mission, and I apologize for some of you that, that uh, had to endure me earlier today, but I'll, I'll kind of repeat it. Uh, the, the mission was to link up with the Northern Alliance. My quick version of Afghan history, uh, Afghanistan had been in a civil war predominantly between the Pashtun. It was Pashtun and Pashtun fighting, and the Uzbek Tajik and Hazar of Afghanistan were largely kind of standing standing by uh, and bandwagoning with one side or the other and trying to carve out what they could. And a very powerful Pashtun movement uh, arose that defeated the other Pashtun called the Taliban, and they swept the country. And the country as a whole wanted peace, so the country as a whole more or less supported the Taliban with holdouts that became the Northern Alliance and their enclaves in the north, so Uzbek, Tajik, and Hazara minority uh, groups. And the Taliban, well, they, they did what, you know, the bulk of the country wanted them to do. They brought peace to the country. And then they brought horror to the country, and the country suddenly found itself uh, uh, with a regime that it no longer supported, but was uh, too much in control for them to do anything about it. As the Taliban became more and more terrible, they became more isolated, and a group called Al Qaeda <coughs> found itself a safe haven, and they basically bought their way in, bought off the government, and you know, then we had 9 11. That's the quick version of it. So, our course of action during the invasion was to link up with the Northern Alliance the enclaves that, that were remaining in the north and helped them to basically turn the tide of the civil war that they had lost. Uh, and we were fifth in the queue to go in and work with the warlords of the Northern Alliance and see what we could do. And that was where I got kind of a strange side mission. Uh, there was a Pashtun named Abdul Haq that was considered friendly to the U.S. And he wanted to go into southern Afghanistan, and he wanted to start a uprising among the Pashtun. So my mission initially was, OK, let's support Abdul Haq. And it was considered sort of a rear, rear area harassment. It wasn't really considered you know, something that would accomplish any major objective, but we can at least uh, make the Taliban worry about their interior lines a little. Then Abdul Haq was, was captured and executed. And then the mission was link up with Hamid Karzai, another friendly Pashtun. Same mission, you know, kind of vague guidance, but see what you can do. And then initially we were told he was captured and executed. And then we were told, never mind, he actually is still alive, he escaped. Uh, and I was told to meet up with him in Pakistan. So I meet up with him in Pakistan, and uh, he has a very different view of the war. The U.S. objective was to support the Northern Alliance. And for a lot it was, you know, if the Northern Alliance leads the North and comes into the South, you're going to have a, an even worse civil war. Because the Pashtun, who are already turning against the Taliban, uh, are going to have to unite with the Taliban against a bigger threat. The Uzbek Tajik and Hazar are the, the Northern Alliance. So if the U.S. succeeds with the Northern Alliance, we're actually going to further unify a group that isn't actually unified. So his solution was, we'll go in, we'll seize a town called Tarancote, it's not far from Kandahar. Uh, and by seizing Tarancote, it would be kind of a beacon for the anti-Taliban movement among the Pashtun. So that was generally the plan. Uh, and, and this is kind of where it returns to the whale story for me, because uh, uh, nobody really wanted us to execute the mission. Uh, it was considered kind of a rear area activity. It was just considered too risky. Uh, I was basically running into resistance from everybody, uh, and, and it, I was all but being blocked from the mission. So if I wanted to go in, it really was going to be me taking it on the chin and forcing it. And so here we are, and the, the mission would be, I go into southern Afghanistan with my 11 men. 
I was one man short on the team. And we start a guerrilla war from scratch in Southern Army without any standing army of any kind uh, in the birthplace of the Taliban in Uruzgan province, literally a stone's throw from where Mullah Omar himself came from. Uh, you know, are you high? I mean, I mean, it, it really was. It, and that's the, the part of this for me that, uh, you know, I'll always kind of question my own motives because in the way I laid it out for you, you know, we're, we're there to prevent civil war. But how much of it was, again, chasing that whale, how much of it was, uh, you know, that, that wound? It, and, and that's the part that for me always kind of sticks with me because uh, I decided that we would go in and uh, I mean, it came down to, uh, I was gonna have to fight it out with my boss. Uh, and my boss was away at a meeting, so I got his deputy who wasn't terribly aware of kind of the situation in the South. Uh, and I said, hey, I've made the call that we're gonna go in. He's like, okay, do you need anything from me? I'm like, nope. And then I made the call and uh, for me, uh, it, it always kind of it always kind of crossed the line because it was definitely a degree of mom against dad. Because uh, I really should have had the conversation with my boss, and, and that's where again it returns to for me. You know, I was a 27 year old uh, captain at that point, and I believe we're preventing a civil war. But I don't know how much of it for me was also uh, you know chasing that whale. For me, I was going to do this right. I was going to do the campaign the right way. I was going to apply all the things that I learned, and uh, by God, we're going to get it right this time. Uh, so I made the call and we went in. Uh, Tom had promised us 300 men, we got 30. Uh, 72 hours after we got in on the ground, we had uh, somewhere between 60 and 100 trucks of bad guys coming after us, and about a thousand of them laying siege to uh, the town we were in in Tarenko. Uh, and we defeated them soundly. It was a touch and go battle, but uh, but we won, uh, and it was a huge victory. And it, it started. Uh, it, it basically elevated Karzai from somebody that nobody knew all that well to the Northern Alliance calling him up directly, and Karzai telling the Northern Alliance to stay in the north. I mean, it was one battle that could have been disastrous. Uh, but my men were properly trained. We had the support we needed. I mean, for me, it was uh, it was a, not an easy fight to win, but I felt like it was still a fight on my terms, unlike what had happened in '94. Uh, I mean, it, it was a it was an incredible fight, uh, but we won, and Terranco was ours. Uh, we then conducted an air campaign from Terranco to Kandahar, where we basically had to seal off the Taliban in Kandahar. Uh, basically, daily airstrikes, keeping them from escaping, and uh, slowly built an army where we finally had the 300 were promised, and we fought our way uh, south to Kandahar. And the Taliban uh, put up a small fight in the end. December 3rd and 4th, we had some kind of fun fighting. Uh, but it, I mean, they, they, it, it was very imbalanced. They weren't ever going to get very far with us. And then December 5th came, and they were ready to surrender. Uh, I mean, it, it, it was an insane, you know, three-week campaign from November 14th to, uh, to December 5th. And I mean, I, I guess I got my wish. I had, I had a fight largely left alone in the South. Uh, and here we were ready for the Taliban to surrender to us. Uh, we're victims of our own success in the end. On the night of December 4th, knowing that the Taliban were going to surrender to us the next day, the headquarters came in. And on the uh, morning of December 5th, as we were basically waiting for the Taliban to come to surrender, uh, the headquarters accidentally called it an airstrike on my men. Uh, and we don't know how many died. All my gorillas were clustered together in the airstrike, so I might have heard 100, I've heard 50. I'm kind of comfortable with about 50 were killed. Everybody on my team was wounded. Uh, Jefferson Davis, 
and Dan Pettitore and my team were killed, and a friend named Cody Foster from the headquarters was killed. And the horrible irony of this was it was December 5th, 2001, I seven years to the day uh, from what happened in 1994 to my platoon in Panama. And, uh, and I think about that a lot, you know, kind of, you know, how it all came together, the decisions I made. I mean, going into Afghanistan was the right call, although I question how pure my motives were. The campaign <clears throat> could not have gone better up until the end. Uh, but then here we were, uh, you know, it was basically the same ending. Um, you know, there's an irony to that. Uh, Really, all, all I could do after that was what I could honor the, uh, the men who died. Uh, you never heard of the uh, riots in Panama in 1994 because nobody told the story. It was kind of passively suppressed. The media never heard about it. There weren't any deaths, just a lot of people heard, so, heard, so uh, it was forgotten. And for me, uh, about the, the last thing I could do to uh, you know, kind of make amends for what happened to my men was just make sure that uh, anybody asked me to talk about it, I would, and it became this sort of, if people want me to talk about the invasion of another one, at least I could do that to honor the men who died under my command. Uh, but yeah, it, it's uh, kind of a different take on things that happened in 2001, but, uh, but the riots in 1994 is something that, uh, you know, for me, weighed heavily on my decisions. Uh, I think the more important thing I'll just say out of it is uh, I can't tell you for sure what the lesson is. Uh, you know, for me, the whale was war, and you know, the, the result to a degree was the same. All my men were wounded or killed again. Uh, I have to say, I believe in what we're fighting for a lot more. You know, but does that matter? I don't know. Uh, so I guess I'll just sort of leave this as a, an open-ended, uh, kind of an open-ended story for your all, for, for all of you. But uh, <coughs> that's what I did in my informative years as a lieutenant and a captain uh, from 94 to 2001. Uh, we all lived happily ever after. Anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. So we'll open up for questions. Uh, thanks so much for your comments. So, yeah, I'll, let's give a round of applause. Yeah, we appreciate it. So you, you can feel them as they come, uh, and that's fine. So please uh, open up for questions. Tom, back there. Sir, sure. Is there a lot of comments coming out for? Um, you mentioned a lot in our class about that Afghanistan was really uh, fought in two wars. I know someone got fights and didn't get that. Um, could you provide a little more information on that, sir? And Mr., what do you think we went wrong with the United States fighting that second war in Afghanistan? Okay, well, the, the first part, what, what I talked about earlier today is that, uh, and, and as I said also earlier today, it, it un unintentionally is, uh, is slightly self serving since I was there on number one. Uh, but I felt like uh, 2002. We really did have the Taliban in full retreat, and they were defeated in a classical sense of defeat. And that's a whole other discussion for what it means to be defeated. Uh, but then they slowly crept back, and we were so focused on Iraq that uh, we just didn't have the resources to do anything about it. We created a degree of a, a power vacuum in Afghanistan by demobilizing a lot of the warlord military. Uh, we're focused on things like narco trafficking that also aggravated the locals. Uh, but our total military presence didn't really change. We had about, we went from 10,000, creeped up to 30,000, and it just kind of stayed there for a long time. And so we, we just weren't doing a whole lot to help with security. Uh, in terms of where it went wrong, uh, I'm going to return to something else I talked about earlier, which is uh, you know, kind of Columbia as an example. I think it's too early to say that we did anything wrong. The, the great challenge that we always face is where we're going to put our resources, where we're going to uh, devote our, our assets. Uh, and 
there are times where you know you have to really uh, make brutal decisions that you know may sacrifice the stability of Afghanistan in order to not lose a war in Iraq, or in this case, uh, you know we've 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 really been trying to find a way to keep as small a footprint on the ground as possible while we decide what direction to go in. And uh, an argument that that I would make. And uh, I could be disproven tomorrow, a year from now, or hopefully never. Is that uh, if Colombia is really kind of an example of what happens if you commit to a place in the long run, I think we could actually uh, we we could actually in the long run see a degree of success, at least as the Afghans would define it, the return to stability. They were a stable country before under the pain, not a perfect country, but a stable country. But I think we can see a return to that if we if we maintain the commitment. Uh, the problem with that, though, is you always look at you know blood and treasure. I was, I, I, the term always kind of annoys me. Uh, and it's really how many people are we willing to lose over there uh, to support the government? Uh, you know, it, it, it's a hard question, let alone how much money we want to commit to it. But. Uh, I mean, I, I believe just looking at, you know, the, the last 15 years that uh, if we actually made a long-term commitment, we made an unwavering commitment, I think we, we may actually find a way to demoralize the Taliban and get them to seriously come to the table. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I guess I'll leave it there. Sir? Sir, is there Carlton Company H3? Uh, you talked a lot about your sense of chasing the whale when you went into Afghanistan, but how much were you also considering the strategic implications of what you're about to do? Did you get a real sense of how big this was going to be? Yeah, I mean, there was something, all of it was surreal. Right? I mean, the attack on the nation, uh, you know, it was like in boxing class, that first punch in the face where you're like, I just got punched. Uh, unless you've been punched before, then it was like that first time. Uh, so, I, I mean, you know, every decision, it, 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 there was this weird, almost dreamlike quality of, so I'm with this guy that's telling me that if I don't take him in, there's going to be a civil war. <coughs> no pressure. Okay. Y you know, so, I mean, my eye was definitely on, on all of that. But the problem is, what what breaks the inertia of you to make a call like that? I mean, I literally did not know if I was going to be court-martialed when I got back. I mean, because for me, it was, I kind of played mom against dad. I mean, there, there was like a full 24 hours for the, for the deputy to talk to the boss and for them to do whatever they did. It's just, I wasn't going to call them to follow up and go, hey, are you sure? Uh, so it wasn't egregious. But I definitely didn't feel good about it, and I literally didn't know if someone was going to uh, be very angry at me whenever the mission ended. Uh, and uh, the call I made to go in, I mean, it definitely wasn't out of arrogance. It wasn't, I know better. It, it was something else. I mean, and, and that's a part of it that I'll never fully get because I. I you know, I'm 44 now, and I look at my 27-year-old self, and it's like, you know, what made you make that call? Uh, when I was teaching here before, for better and for worse, I mean, my goal was always to try to be honest about things, because it, it wasn't this patent of it of, I read your book. You know, that wasn't it. it. I don't know what pushed me over the edge on it. I mean, I trusted Hamid. We all liked him a lot and respected him. Uh, we believed what he was saying, but I still had to make a call that was, you know, I, I had to push something that I knew uh, uh, people were kind of actively working against. And so it's kind of the only thing I could tell you is that uh, I, I was still feeling a lot of pain from what happened in 94, and it was, uh, it was that way, <coughs> you know. Uh, what else? That he died. See, I, I, I killed everybody. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there, Dynamic Company H3. Uh, you said that uh, 
your headquarters dropped an effort on you, how did that affect your, your trust in sort of like the organization as a whole? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to sidestep this kind of intentionally to begin with, and if you don't like it, then ask me again, and I'll, I'll be fine with being a little bit more rude, I guess. But uh, one thing I, I had to come to grips with was that in every war you have friendly fire. I'll put that out there. Uh, and friendly fire is so ubiquitous, great word, I never get to use that word. Uh, that, I mean, it, people die from friendly fire, they die from enemy fire, it's war, and people die from it. Uh, the other thing that also happens all the time is that you have people that want to get in on the action to check blocks. Before the invasion of Panama, there were stories of people being bumped out of the way so this guy could get in into the chalk order and earn his month, his uh, mustard stain on his jump line. So you hear all these stories of you know those kinds of uh, you know abuses. Uh, let alone Desert Storm, Vietnam. I mean, it, every war has that, and. and uh, so I viewed it really more as I thought we were better than that, but here we are and in every major conflict, and you can see examples of that. So what does that mean? Uh, and it, in my more cynical moments, I, I view it as, you know, like DUIs. Well, we're always going to have DUIs. No, we just need to have a better Friday brief before the weekend. You know, what do you do about it? And, and, and that's a part of it that for me is, uh, you know, where you could, the, the French have a, a saying, say la guerre, and so not just meant ironically, you know, well, that's the war. Uh, and, you know, and, and so for me, I, I don't really know where to place that. Uh, because it, it's sort of at once a bigger issue than a couple of idiots doing things they shouldn't be doing. And yet it's also just a bigger dynamic of what happens when you go to war. Uh, you know, I was trying to think of what to say here, what to talk to you guys about. Uh, and I've, uh, I thought this might be kind of a unique take on it. I told them it, to tell me if it was a totally bizarre way to explain the experience, but going back to 94 and everything, because I don't think we talk about the fact that I mean, war is inherently awful. Uh, we don't really explain why it's awful. You know, when you put your hand into a bunch of goo that a moment before is your best friend's face, okay, hey, great speech, but what makes war awful? And a lot of the things that make it awful are, are the things like seemingly being betrayed by leadership, but it's also kind of a bigger dynamic than that. You know, look at what happened with Tillman and the Friendly Fire. They do a double envelopment and they get shot. Uh, you know, the actual action itself wasn't all that remarkable. It was all the controversy after the fact in terms of was there a cover up or wasn't there. But the friendly fire itself that involved him happens again in every war, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I thought I'd, I'd focus on the whale because, uh, you know, for me, all I knew is I was wounded in 94 and wounded <coughs> again in 2001. And really, I was wounded by war, which happens when you go to war, you get wounded. It's kind of ironic if you think about it. Uh, I mean, I, I will say, because of their saying, that the best days of my life were in Afghanistan during, during those three weeks. Uh, as horrible as it ended, those were still some of the best weeks of my life. You know, for me, December 3rd, 2001, uh, me and my gorillas taking on this whole village of Taliban, I mean, outnumbered and chasing them out of there. I, I mean, when December 3rd comes around, it's a couple days before the 5th, but it's kind of the day that I toast to my gorillas, knowing that a couple days later, most of them were killed in the airstrike. But there's the good and the bad, and that all I conclude is that's war. 
that's when we come back around to the trail. Uh, that's almost kind of too pithy, you know. Uh, in the same way that uh, people who thump uh, their chest talking about how brave they're going to be in combat, they see combat for the first time, and they're the first ones literally pissing themselves, and then it's the quiet one that's out there winning the Medal of Honor, taking on 100 people with a P-38 camera burn. You know, kind of funny that way. Anyway. Sir. Sir, so I think some portion of this audience is uh, they're students from my solar class and members of our regular warfare group. We spent a lot of time talking about unconventional warfare doctrine and partnering with indigenous forces. Can you comment a little bit on um, your training in the Q course and how that prepared you to deal with the situation and the challenges of working with quills on the ground? Yeah, uh, so uh, kind of a, a broader lesson for, for all y'all, for plural. Uh, I guess you have to go to the South to get that story. Um, so, you know, you, you, I don't know what all the, the basic skills are you're learning. You know, when I was a cadet, we're taking a part of M60s. Now, hopefully, it's 240s. Please tell me it's 240s and not M60s. Well, I miss you, M60s. Uh, you know, you, you're trained throughout your career, and for those of you that are prior service, there, there, was, there was just all that crap that, that you train on and you're, you're kind of scratching your head saying, yeah, well, you know, I've been deployed, you never do it this way, whatever. Uh, and the, the one thing about going from the peacetime army to the wartime army that was kind of awesome for me was to see that uh, the army actually got a lot of stuff right uh, in terms of the training. When I was in the Q course in, uh, I think it was 98, uh, you fight a guerrilla war, and uh, Ron and Sage, they, it, it's kind of weird, because you learn the principles, but you don't really get the intents of this is how you fight a guerrilla war until the end of the Q course, um, at least when I was there. You know, it was all theory, and then it was hands-on. Uh, and our instructors were telling us the whole time, well, this is kind of a rite of passage, we need to teach this, you'll never do this. Uh, it's this accelerated guerrilla war that lasts, you know, a week, and then yeah, that won't happen. You know, it's all that. Uh, so here we are invading Afghanistan, and what do I have to fall back on? Well, this training I was told I'd never have to use. And I applied it verbatim, and it worked perfectly. And even the war only lasted about a week. I mean, okay, sure, it lasted four, but I mean, it, it was, it really, uh, <coughs> Everything they taught us in the Q course about how to fight a guerrilla war, we're able to apply, and that's what made us successful on the ground in Afghanistan. And I found so many things like that, so many kind of cool things that I learned over the years in the military uh, that would suddenly pop up, and you'd be like, wow, I'm glad I learned that. Uh, but uh, the Q course really got it right. I mean, the 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 biggest principle that they hammered home, and they would beat the crap out of you if, if you didn't remember it, is you stay with the gorilla chief. You stay with the gorilla chief. And what that means is you get joined at the hip, you build rapport, and you make sure that the two of you are talking constantly because it's how you build trust. It's how you build that relationship. It's also how you're there if there's anything going on because if he has any doubt whether or not to send somebody to tell you about it, well, you're sitting right there and he will tell you about it right there. Um, I mean, if, if, if what we did in the South was considered uh, uh, at all well executed, it was because of the training in the Q course. Um, you know, it, it really was, uh, all of us just fell back on the training and the training worked. It, it, was, it was kind of remarkable and then when I got back, uh, I went and talked to the Q course and, uh, and was kind of making fun of the instructor saying, hey, you know, remember when I graduated a, you know, a few years back and he said, you know, I'd never do it. Well, I did. Don't change a thing. And that was kind of what we emphasized. And then they, they improved on other things, but the training was really good. Uh, I mean, so much of rural warfare comes down to building trust, sharing the risk. Uh, you know, one thing that, that's so funny to say now is, uh, I mean, we didn't bring body armor with us, we didn't bring helmets. When we went in, I was wearing, essentially what you guys are wearing now, and that was it. Uh, I mean, we had our kit, but, you know, we weren't any better protected than the gorillas were. Uh, 
And for us, there wasn't even a question about it. It's, we have to share risk with the gorillas. We're not gonna wear IBA and all that. That's kind of silly. We had it ready. We had it ready for like, uh, once we took major cities, if we needed it dropped in, and then we were ready for it to be dropped in on us for, you know, like room clearing kinds of things if it came to it. Uh, you know, build rapport, share, share the risks, share the hardships. I mean, we, we, we live by those principles and it served us well over there. What else? Celebrity status you enjoy was that also hollow as well, or did some part of you enjoy those? Um, yeah, you know, uh, um, yeah, that, is a, that is a hard one, but it's, it's a good one. Uh, I, I felt like I felt like what we did in 94 was so futile. Uh, I felt like all of it was just so half-baked and just stupid. Uh, I mean, I had guys who were crippled for life from their wounds there. Uh, you know, and, and it, it just was all a big mess. And I felt like uh, as horrible as it ended on December 5th that what we did was important. Uh, <coughs> You know, and I, I felt very good about what we accomplished on the ground. I felt very good about, you know, what, what my men did. Uh, and about all I could conclude is, uh, you know, kind of the blinding flash of the obvious that uh, war is never bloodless. There is no planning the perfect fight. You know, here's the other thing. I, you know, I told you about December 3rd being an, an amazing day. December 4th was actually almost as incredible a day because we were able to conduct this, you know, kind of this attack on a hill. It was, it's hard to explain, but we got everybody working and we took the hill and one of my guys got shot through the neck. Uh, he lived, but here we are on the hill, we took the hill and got shot uh, through the neck, enters the neck, exits through the upper back, we had a medevac on. Uh, and, uh, I mean, you know, he was fine, it all worked out for him, and it was good that he got medevac or actually would have died on December 5th, which was kind of a weird part of all that for him, because when we got medevac, we caught up to him uh, in Oman. Uh, but that, that was, you know, another one of those days where it was just kind of seeing everybody working together so effectively, uh, even with Wes being shot, uh, you know, Wes is a great guy, but I, I just, I never really think about, oh, and we got shot as a negative, it was, well, it's war, he lived, and we needed that pill, you, you know. Uh, and, and kind of in a broad sense for the whole campaign, you know, with everything being killed or wounded in the end, uh, Dan Pettitore was the most kind of outspoken saying that Hamid was going to be the future leader of the country. And I would be like, no, I don't mean, no, he's not, you know, whatever. And then as time went on, I mean, for Dan, he was so excited by what we were doing. I remember uh, Hamid wrote a note to me that said, uh, there's a convoy coming from, um, uh, Rau, please don't bomb it. And so a runner like comes over to this different area we were in. It was all just kind of a spread out compound. Gives me a note, I like my lap, because how often do you get a note going, hey, please don't bomb these guys? It was very polite. And I kind of chuckled and I threw up the burn bag and Dan was like, can I keep it? Like, yeah, you can keep it. And we didn't bomb the convoy. Um, <laughs> but I, I mean, one of the big contrasts between 94 and 01 was, I mean, Dan, Dan was one of my, two guys that died on the team. Uh, and I know that Dan believed in the mission and believed in what we were doing. Uh, that isn't to say that there's a witness cast. You know, 
notice and to say that what happened in 94 was completely senseless because it was still part of broader policy. But it does make it a hell of a lot easier to live with. You know, because it, at least, uh, you know, the, the fight of our choosing was one that we all believed in very much, you know. Uh, but then in all the years after with, you know, with all the media and everything, um, I really hate giving talks. I did it for the reason I said, and that, that's kind of uh, the, the part of this that, you know, it's kind of a, the, the, you know, the M. Night shot mine twist on it all is, uh, I saw what happened in 94 when nobody had ever, ever heard of that. Uh, and I wasn't gonna let that happen, so if people wanted me to tell the story, I would. But doing this, talking to you guys, uh, I'm out feel sick for the next week. I mean, I just, uh, it, it was never me, but it was a means to an end. And for me, it was doing what I could for, especially the families of my guys that died. Uh, one of my soldiers from Panama uh, was uh, drunk uh, IMing me on Facebook one night, and uh, when we went into the camp, he was like cut away to do a different job, so he had to sit outside and watch us go in and uh, see what happened. And it, it was like this 3 a.m. You know, hey, remember? You know, I, I hope you know that I wish I'd been there. Or, you know, and it was all this regret. Uh, and I wrote him back, you know, knowing, knowing he was probably drunk from what he wrote. And I'm like, hey, don't worry about it, you know. I, we, didn't, we didn't text all that far, you know, right back and forth that much. Uh, hadn't seen him in a long time. And they killed himself a week later. And uh, I don't think he killed himself through the Panama, but it was something that weighed on him so much that one of the last things we wanted to make sure he told me before he decided to kill himself was he did all the kid that day. I mean, that, that was how much it screwed with a lot of us. You know, because it, it was just what just happened, and then it was as if it never happened. And so, you know, for me, it was after after Afghanistan, you know, honor the sacrifice of my men. Uh, and make sure that, you know, it, it just, make sure that, that the whole story was never forgotten. And I always did it professionally. And that's the thing, is I never said, you know, and that bastard did this and it killed my men. Because that wouldn't have really served the bigger purpose. You know, for me, I always wanted to just focus on what my men did over there. Uh, this is a little bit different from what I normally talk about, because it seems like I just focus on the campaign. But, uh, you know, this is... I just retired, so this is kind of like another farewell tour sort of thing, so I thought I'd mix it up a little bit and be a little bit more real about it. Uh, and also, I just hit a point where I realized I, I'd done enough. There's just somewhere along the way I realized that the whole story has been told. People know what really happened. People know what, what killed my men. People know what we accomplished, for better or for worse, with, with Hamid. Uh, and I can kind of, you know, put the rucksack down and move on from it. Uh, but yeah, all those years were hard. It was always, it, it, the hardest thing I did was a cold air report. Uh, and I mean, I was for, for about six months after, I mean, I was just emotionally exhausted because uh, I kind of inadvertently, I, I thought it was going to be a small interview and I was the guest on the show. And I'm like, I, was ne I never wanted to be the voice of 10 years in Afghanistan, and that's what I was. And so for me, it was any good I might have done. You know, I could completely screw up on the Colbert Report by coming off like a complete moron. Uh, and I invited uh, Nikki Petitori, Dan's sister, because uh, again, for me, anything I did it was always about the man. Uh, so she was sitting 10 feet away from me while I was talking about it. It was hard. Uh, but yeah, for me, it, it was, uh, it was, it was you know, trying to make something right. And then I'd also slip in anything about Panama that I could when I, when I had a chance. Uh, um, you know, it, 
because it, it would also just kind of, people would be like, huh, something happened in Panama? And it was really, there wasn't any more I could do for my guys from Panama, but at least if I could find a way to get that out there, at least there'd be some recognition for what happened to them. So of course, that's all the time we have. Um, <clears throat> thanks for that very important. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I think we can all easily learn that. Uh...